I really value living more than working. And so I have always felt this way. Like I want to live life more than I am just behind a computer, et cetera. And so like, it's a really big goal for me to retire early. My dad retired when he was 45. Hello and welcome to Financials Podcast, Future Rich. I'm your host, Barbara Ginty, and I'm also a CFP, which is a certified financial planner. And I'd like to welcome my guest, Raquel. Hi, Raquel. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. I'm based in New York City and um, yeah, excited to chat through stuff. Yeah, we're happy to have you. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So age, um, so we know you're in New York City, income, all that jazz. So I am 35 years old. I've been living in New York City for 10 years, originally from Miami. Uh, my income is roughly 170 K a year. Um, I recently have transitioned into working in-house. I've owned my own company for the past seven years. Last year I had a bit of sort of a sabbatical stepped away from work for half the year. My dog sadly got really sick. And so, um, kind of just stuck around with him for end of life care And then um, once he passed, tried getting back into the market and getting clients again. But I work in the creative world. So with all the strikes going on and just a lot of advertising budgets being cut, it was really difficult finding work. So it pretty much all of last year of 2023, I was out of work. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was meant to be a a shorter sabbatical. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I found it to be like kind of a serendipitous closing. I had a few retainer clients like close out towards the end of 2022, a few random smaller stuff kind of trickle in. And then 2023 is when I got like the diagnosis for my dog that he was really sick. And so I was just like, you know what, let me just take this as an opportunity to like hang with him in his last days. His prognosis was pretty poor. Um, so we thought it was like days to week kind of situation, but then he wonderfully ended up like kicking it for like six months. So um, even that portion was like grateful for that extra time, Mm -hmm. but was a surprise as far as like being away from work for that long. And so when you say uh, you're a creative, so you were, you owned your own business doing creative work Mm -hmm. and having clients. And then now you went in-house as a creative. Yeah. So um, just as I was looking for work, it like became increasingly apparent how grim the job market is for the kind of straddle creative and tech. I work in advertising. Um, so I'm either on set producing stuff or art directing or doing social strategy. So it's like kind of these two worlds. So yeah, things were just looking kind of grim. So I was like, all right, I'm open to anything. If I end up going in-house, fine, I'll take it. But um, it's it's been a real also just emotional shift going from running your own business to then reporting to someone else and their sort of oh, rules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And do you work remote or you work in an office? I work remote. Before 2023, my, my income with my own business was really high. For the past few years before that, I was making over 200K. Oh, wow. And that was your take home from the business was 200K? It was a little bit less than that, but it was, it was pretty high. So I was probably anywhere between like 180 to 200 around there. Okay. And that was like the prior, like 2022, 2021, 2020 was a little bit less than that, but still really productive. And yeah, 2020 was like really when I saw a big increase from like what I had been making in my business to after, which even before that I was like making like a hundred ish, you know? So like, it was still a very like viable income, you know? Yep. And how long did you have your business? I've had it for about seven years and I still, I still have it now. So yeah, I haven't like fully put it to rest. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm kind of at like a crossroads. I'm not really sure how my career will develop at this point. Um, I love being my own boss and creating my own framework of how I want to work, the clients I want to work with, the ways that I determine that is social justice is like a really huge part of 
my values and ethics. So like, Mm -hmm. it's awesome owning my own company and being able to work with brands that, um, are in alignment there. So Mm -hmm. going to corporate America is certainly not that, (laughs) but you know, so I, I'm, I still have hope. I still have like sort of trickling income from there, but like that's maybe like a thousand dollars a month, but you know, previously I was making like over $20,000 a month with that. So it's, it's staggering. Um, the difference, the drop off. Yeah. And just real quick, are you single partnered? I am a single, I have a boyfriend. He's significantly lower income than I am, Okay, but we don't live together. So all of the expenses are, are, are mine. The only one that I think is kind of like informed a little bit by him is groceries because I don't like cooking and he's an amazing cook. So that's kind of our unspoken agreement. Like I end up buying groceries for essentially more than one person. And in exchange, when he's over, he cooks. Me cooks. Food. That's nice. That's nice. Very yeah. fair. Um, okay. So yeah, that is really interesting that the business went from 20,000 a month to 1000 a month. Yeah. And you think it's just the industry where it is right now. So it's two things. So I had retainer clients that were social media, the social work. It's very easy to create these retainer clients when you're managing social media, there is never an end date. So like the shortest contract I would sell would be for three months, you know, Um, but typically they're for a year. So I have that baseline income and, you know, would book three or four clients on that. And that is a very viable, like each of those clients were usually around like $4,000 each. So those would kind of fluctuate, but as long as I had even one of those, like I would be okay. And yeah. thankfully I'd been, I was making a lot, you know, booking a lot more than that. And then separately working in production. So I work in advertising. So my set days are like, you know, two or three days or one day here, one day okay. there. So it's much more like gig type work. Okay. But those, my day rate for those are anywhere from like 1200 to 1600 a day. Wow. So even if I get a couple of days a month, it, it significantly yeah, impacts my income. Yeah. So that is the area where I would love to lean into again. That's where it's been the hardest Okay. for things to pick back up. And things are still kind of tricky. Advertising dollars everywhere are down. And unfortunately, with all the strikes going on, it leads to a landscape where everyone's really desperate for work, really low on income. And unfortunately leads a lot of agencies, producers, et cetera, to kind of be exploitative. So if you were making Mm -hmm. 1400 a day, well, now we're only going to offer you 700. Are you going to take it or leave it? There's other people that'll do it for 600, you know, like, so Mm -hmm. it's, it's pushing the prices down because there's, there's there's less demand and there's so many people willing to fill the demand. Yeah. So that has been an unfortunate consequence. Um, I think things are rebounding, but it's still like, that was more so the the less stable part of my work. You know, like mm-hmm. I might get booked one day out of the month for that, or there are times where I'd be booked 10 days out of the month for that, which is like wow. an incredible, massive difference, you know? Yes. And so my retainer social clients is, was really like, I thought of as like my salary. Yep. And then that other stuff was bonus. Yes. So I think what's been tricky um, is that since the end of 2022 to now, just with the introduction of so much AI, you know, optimizations, like I'm thinking that it may be less and less likely for me as a small business owner to continue to offer these services just because there's so many optimizations and so many softwares that me as a small business wouldn't be able to afford. Like using one in-house now in my corporate America job, that AI software is $70,000 a year. Like that's not something I would be able to engage in. And that's, that's one of the many that you can. Mm -hmm. And so like, I, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm like trying to straddle, like, is that a viable future or have I been like essentially, yeah, kind of like beaten out by tech as tech, being like yeah. a business owner, you know? So like, I'm not sure really what the pathway forward is. I can, you know, I'm trying to, like, I also do hand modeling on the side, which is crazy. That could be like 
$3,000 for five hours. It's so like trying, I have these other sources of income Mm -hmm. that I could lean into. I'm, I have an agent for that. Like I could get potentially How does one get an agent for hand modeling. <laughs> it's so funny. Do you like it, tr- do you um, go and like try out? I'm, j- I'm really curious. Did you just go and try out? No. So oh. it is, it's really unusual. There's, there's really only like two agencies in all of New York. And it's like these two women who run it, who have just been like ruling the scene for decades um, there's one other. I love, I love really niche niche roles. I think it's really it's so wild. In with like yeah, when someone's like, I do this, and you're like, what? I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> I know, and that's it's so it's so so wild. Yeah, no, it, this kind of came to be from like working with clients. I so I do on set. I'm a production designer, a prop stylist. So I'm the one that like okay. Oh, you want to be in a diner? Let's pick these plates and these mugs and these forks. Oh, cool. And we would have final booths. We wouldn't have these types of stools. We wouldn't, you know, like so. Yeah. I'm like creating the scene and then working on like smaller scale sets, like tabletop sort of scenes. Working with clients that haven't like didn't have budget for talent, and so they'd be like, we just need a hand, you know, like if it's a a jewelry company, just like a hand peeking in the frame, like picking up a ring or something like that. So like over years accrued a crazy portfolio with super impressive clients. And when things sort of were financially getting grim for me last year, I was like, okay, it's time for me to like capitalize on this. Um, I reached out to all the agencies that I knew of, which are really three main ones, um, got signed by one of them. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've booked a few jobs through them. Some of them are like $800 for a day rate. Some of them have been $3,500 for a day rate. Like it's, wow, it can be really, really staggering and a great source of income. And something that I could age with, right? Like, yeah, I love that you went and sought that out where like it just kind of was very serendipitous that you just happened to be on set. They happened to need a hand and that you accrued this portfolio. And when times got tight, you're like, okay, let me see if I can capitalize on this. Totally. Barbara, I feel like that's been my entire career where I'm like, oh, I accidentally am here. Who knew? (laughs) I guess let's do this. Um, It's, it is so, yeah, that has been just, yeah, the story of my career. Yeah, I think that's amazing. So I could potentially try to get signed also with an agent to represent me as a prop stylist and set designer. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's a whole journey as well. Okay, so it sounds like you've had a lot of flux. You know, obviously some of it has to do with the industry, but you're obviously for your work very creative, but also very creative in coming up with income streams, which is really impressive. So let's dive into where your numbers are and then... Uh, some of the things you asked about in your submissions. You're making $171,000 at this new in-house corporate job. Yes. Um, Do you want to run me through what your expenses are? Totally. And then we'll go through savings and debt from there. Yeah. And I also, so I don't know if this is like helpful to like mention too. I really value living more than working. And so I have always felt this way. Like I want to live life more than I am just behind a computer, et cetera. And so like, it's a really big goal for me to retire early. My dad retired when he was 45. Oh, wow. What did your dad do? So my dad was a mechanical engineer, um, but he was incredibly frugal. And um, part of his retirement plan include going back to his native country, which is Colombia. So the exchange rate is much more beneficial for him. So yeah, so that was part of it. But he made it work. <laughs> like whatever it is, like he saved tremendously. I think I asked him a couple of years ago, like what was the most he was ever making? And it, I think he said somewhere around like 70 or 75,000. Like granted, this was decades ago. Um, and inflation, just the value of money changes over time. But like it's crazy to me, like thinking. And I, and I felt this way too, when I was making around $200,000 a year for myself and my own company, this like degree of overwhelm of like, I know this is a lot of money, but I just simply don't know what to do with it. And I know I want to retire early and I don't know how to execute that. So anyways, some other background information. Yeah. But, let's uh, get into the, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Cause yes, in your submission, you said you're 35 and you want to potentially or consider retiring at 45. So yeah, yeah. let's dive into the numbers and, and see what they say. 
Okay. So for my household expenses, this is my rent, a storage unit, which is like kind of parsed from like half business stuff, half personal stuff. Okay. Um, but so rent, yeah. storage unit, rental insurance, cell phone, my like phone budgeting app and internet. This is what I consider my household expenses. Mm -hmm. um, my other utilities, um, gas and electric are paid for included in my rent. But okay. so this is 1856, which is insanely low for New York. I Yeah. Especially including gas, that's utilities. Those are your fixed costs, right? So that covers your living costs. Yep. Including your yep. storage unit. Yeah. That's very low for New York. Yeah. Yeah. My, my rent alone is, is 1400, which like, I'm just like, I need to stay here for it ever. Um, it was, yeah, uh, unheard of, but okay. So that's my household expenses. My pet expenses are 312. That's like dog food, toys, dog insurance, and Rover, like dog walking mm -hmm. services, transit. So between like parking gas, um, like easy pass, MTA, car insurance, random Ubers, and then plus a car payment, which we can get to in a second, but it's my car is paid off. I got a personal loan from my dad, so I need to pay him off, but there's no interest there. Okay. But so all of those together, it's a thousand eighty-five dollars. Okay. Um, and these are all like I broke all of these things down, so it's like monthly. Um perfect. Food and beverage. So this is restaurants, going to bars, wine shops, groceries and coffee is 1175 health this includes my paying off my peloton bike my peloton membership a like in-person gym membership my medications and like vitamins probiotics all of that comes to 421 dollars because you have health insurance through your corporate job yeah so that i didn't like put in here yeah that's fine okay my business expenses like currently are just like QuickBooks, a few like my website, different subscriptions, et cetera, is 148. And okay. I'm just kind of folding business into personal right now just for mm -hmm. of looking at numbers in a wider sense. Yeah, it's really fine. My student loans are... Um, I'm paying right now $11 a month, but this is based off of me essentially not having an income last year. So okay. I, that needs to be readjusted to reflect my current income. I'm on like the income dependent repayment plan or whatever. What's your balance on those? And what was your, your payment previously when you had your own business? So... I've kind of been deferring them for a long time. The total on that is 26,665 at an average of a 4% interest rate. Okay. So when we had these like student student loan like forgiveness like bills being passed, mm -hmm. $20,000 of this was supposed to be cleared and then whatever happened at the last minute that that got nixed. So I just struggle with this because I'm like, I really don't want to pay it if it's about to be cleared. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but so that's that's that. My subscriptions are um, $91 a month. Um, okay. This is like Audible, New York Times, Spotify, Google, Apple Cloud stuff. And then I didn't know what to call this um, – I don't know, grouping. I just called it indulge. Uh, but it's like hair, nails, entertainment, clothing, gifts, etc. Is okay. these are all estimates. So I feel like it's hard to tell, but based off of like kind of what I was thinking was 325 a month. Okay. And then travel, I have no idea how to like calculate this. Before COVID, I would like snowbird every winter and go to okay. Southeast Asia and like travel for three or four months out of the year. COVID hit, didn't travel at all, didn't travel, you know, like, and so yeah. like, I'm trying to like get my footing to be like, what does that look like now? Mm -hmm. But so I put $500 a month. Like, yeah, that feels reasonable. 
you know. So all these expenses sum to about fifty four hundred dollars a month. Okay. And with your with your new job, what's the vacation policy? So I get twenty days vacation, and I think ten oh. six days. So oh, that's really that that feels like a lot. But is it twenty vacation days in addition to like holidays? Yes. Because there's usually like 10 to, depends on the company, there can be 10 to I think upwards of 15. Yeah, they do. They have pretty limited holiday. Like, for example, like in December, you only get like Christmas Day okay. off and like you don't get like the week between the like Christmas and New Year's off. Like it's. Yeah. Yeah. I think the week between Christmas is a creative, usually a creative thing, I think. Yeah. So that is, those are all my expenses. And then I can walk you through my current investments or like what I currently have. Like yeah. Perfect. With. Okay. Perfect. So my current investments are a combination of like Roth IRA, traditional IRA, SEP IRA. I always forget the acronym for this. ETP, EFT? ETF. <laughs> Yes. Um, so a combination well, of those. I'm, I'm, happy to, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to hear the, the word set, which means you had a savings, a retirement savings when you had the business. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, and that was honestly like before, you know, 2023 was like the really grim year for me mm-hmm. where everything became unstable. But prior to that, I'd been like I, I really was just at a loss of what to save. And I knew mm-hmm. my like lifestyle scope creep, however you describe that, like it yep. expanded so much just because I didn't know what to do with the money. And I was saving a, a minimum of $2,000 a month and still felt like I had too much yep. money to know what to do with, which is such an insane blessing to have. I never, ever, ever thought I would be there. But um having that savings of $2,000 a month is what really helped me kind of get through 2023. I still got into okay. about $40,000 of credit card debt, um, okay. which I have recently paid off. So I no longer have credit oh, card debt. Oh, you don't have any credit card debt. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. So you got that all paid off. Okay. But yeah, having that, that $2,000 a month for, I'm saving that for like a year or two or whatever, like really helped me. Yeah. Buffer my down year. However. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the sabbatical because you had, yeah. ca- you had cash available, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. So you don't have any credit card debt. So is the only debt you have the student loan and the loan to your dad? Yes, exactly. Okay. How much is it that you owe your dad? Um, I owe him, I think it's $25,000. Okay. And that was for the car. Yeah, that was for the car. I, so at the end of last year, my lease was up and I was like looking for a car. Last year I moved out to the Rockaways. Um, Oh, wow. Okay. So like a car is kind of necessary. Necessary. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like the suburbs of New York city. Yeah. For those listening who don't know, that's like how far on that, on the rock, to get to the Rockways from Manhattan on the subway is in an hour and a half. Oh yeah. It's, hour? it's yeah. It's like minimum. Yeah. Minimum like an hour 15. You could take the yeah, ferry. That's it's far. So it's part of Queens. Yeah. It's still New York city. It's just like literally yeah. the tiniest little peninsula hanging off there. So but, yeah, I would think you would want a car if you were going to be living on the outskirts, I guess. Yeah. Or the suburbs of the city, I guess is a good way to describe it. Yeah. I was looking into cars and they were just so expensive. I was like cars that were older than mine, like less uh, luxurious, more miles were more expensive than just buying out my car. Mm -hmm. And 2020 is when I got my lease. It's a Lexus SUV that's like has all these upgrades and like recognize that I don't need all of those things now. It was definitely a time in my life where I had the money and I was like, (laughs) <laughs> I was like, if I can't have people, I'll have things. Um, and got something that really is over the top. It was a weird situation where I'm like, I could get a sort of like a jankier car for m- more money. So let me just buy this out, but I don't have the funds. So that's why my dad, you know, very graciously loaned okay. me that money. Okay, perfect. What do we have saved up? 
So I have across all of my investment accounts, and this is excluding, <laughs> this is so bad, all of my 401ks from my like three previous employers, I have never rolled over. I have no idea who they're with. I have no idea to e like how to even approach that. Do you know how much is in the, in them? Do you get statements on them? I have, I have no idea, Barbara. <laughs> but they were like, each of them, I worked at them for anywhere from like one year to like two and a half, three years. So like okay. there's, there's something in them. Um, I just don't know how much, how to find out where to go. Um, and the fun part is two of the three of these have are businesses that have closed. I was just going to ask you if the businesses are still around. Yeah. So I was say, you could just call like the HR company of the entity and just ask. Yeah. One of them is the other one is Starbucks. I can definitely figure that out, but the other two oh, yeah, are you could, yeah. companies. That okay. So those are included. We have three little outlier accounts. Yeah. So these three okay. are not included. I have no idea what's in them. So my okay. current 401k, my like high, high yield savings, which maybe, I don't know if you want it in this. Yeah. Like do you want to break out like your, let's go through each account just because Retirement's okay. a bit different than non-retirement. Okay. So I have with this company, Wealthfront, they have a Roth IRA. That's 23340 Okay. Betterment is another brand that I do my, I already forgot, ETFTs. Exchange traded funds. So it's an investment account. With, with Betterment, you can have um, exchange traded funds inside of a uh, Roth inside of an IRA. So uh, just to confirm, the Betterment account is a brokerage account or an investment account. It's non-retirement. Okay. Um, so it's a combination. So I have okay. the these exchange funds. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also have with them my SEP and a traditional IRA. Okay. And then the exchange funds, what is the title on those? What is, how is it structured? I don't know. Um, I don't know what that means, Barbara. <laughs> so, so for instance, it would just say like a non, it would say non-retirement, it would just have your name on it. So I have three that are non-retirement. So they are like, why I was initially drawn to them is that you can do sort of like focus. I'm like, just so out of the loop with all of, all of this stuff clearly. Um, but so they kind of have like templates of like, there's a social impact focused one. There's a climate impact focused one. Mm -hmm. You can have one that's just sort of like general non-impact related. So I have a social impact non-retirement okay. exchange account with them that has $10,192, a climate impact okay. that's 9,887. Nine, 9, Non-impact, non-retirement is 10,685. My SEP with them is 9,992. My traditional IRA with them is 6,258. Okay, perfect. So give or take, we have about 16,000 with Betterment, that's retirement, right? And then yeah. 29, we'll just say 30, a little over 30,000. That's uh -huh. indiv individual, meaning personally non-retirement. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I like in my brain, I just like catalog that as retirement, but you're totally right. I can, I can pull out from that at any point in time. Mm -hmm. It's taxed differently as well, which is why I like to okay. break down whether you have got it. Like a SEP, a traditional IRA will be taxed similarly, which is it's going to be ordinary income when it comes out. Okay. Right. And then if you take out before 59 and a half, there's going to be a 10% penalty and then there'll be taxed as ordinary income on the way out. Your Roth IRA after it meets the rim or it meets the qualification, which is generally speaking is it has to be in there for five years and you're over 59 and a half comes out completely tax free. And then when we're, when, that's why mm -hmm. I was trying to get the breakdown. If it's non-retirement individually owned, that is taxed at capital gains rate if it's held for more than 12 months and one day. Um, and you have access to it at any point. And I've talked about this on the podcast before. The interesting thing about that is when you were mentioning borrowing to get the car you needed money, 
you can lend against you can lend against investments just like you can any other individually owned asset like a house you can take a you can borrow against it now it just depends whether if it's in your best interest to borrow against it right. with the interest rates right so but i always talk with people who don't own homes because there's a, always like a big push like you should own a home you can always borrow against it you can always in, borrow against investments or usually can borrow against investments and people don't realize that but you cannot borrow against retirement investments got it okay i mean you can take a 401k loan but if you have a traditional ira or sep ira you can't lend against it but if you have money in an individual account you can lend against it if you have you know depending on who your provider is yes that makes total sense yeah, in my brain, I'm just like betterment. Just don't look at it, don't touch it, just forget it exists. Um, yeah, but yeah, we, yeah, yeah, let it grow. Yeah, um, I also have with Amex a high yield savings that has fourteen thousand three hundred and twenty six. Okay, and then my current four hundred one k is a combination of so my company matches up to four percent for a Roth four hundred one k. So I have four percent towards that. And then they also offer employee pre-tax and I have 16% of my income towards that. But so currently right, right now I have $14,300. That's fantastic. And then, yeah, plus the wild card 401k. Yeah. <laughs> that we have to, that we have to find. So those will be nice extras. Okay, so I have for just retirement. So this is Roth IRA, SEP, traditional IRA, and my 401k. So that comes to 53,890. Okay, let me just go back through. So I have, we have the Roth IRA for approximately 23,340, right? Uh huh. And then we have your current 401k at 14,000, it was 300 and something. And 300, yeah. Okay, 14,300. Perfect. Okay. And then we have the traditional IRA at 6,258, right? Plus the SEP mm -hmm. at 9,972. Yeah, 50, 000, okay. So 53,870. And then your non retirement is 30,764. So my non retirement, I have. Like, I guess if, like, would it be helpful to look at this as like all my like liquid assets, I guess? Like what? Because I have like my checking and my savings that I haven't shared either. Yeah, we'll go through that in a second with the cash, but like for investments that are not retirement. Got it. Okay. So then I have for those $45,090. Okay. And that's the... The betterment, the social is 10,192. The climate is 9,887. The non impact is 10,685. Mm -hmm. And then high yield savings, would that be accounted for in here or no? Mm -mm. Just because okay. it's not invested. It's making money, but I'm not including it as an investment. Okay, got it. Okay, so then just those extraneous betterment ones is 30,764. Perfect. Okay. Not retirement and we have retirement okay and then let's talk about cash right so if it's not invested it's great that it's making money now in this new environment but in theory it's not going to make as much as an investment account right because it's fixed right um so you have your high yield savings down at fourteen thousand three twenty six, and then what do you have also in checking and savings so i have i have a combination of things do you want this the total or kind of like each account broken up Sure, we could do each account. Okay, so I have I have a personal checking that's eighteen thousand four hundred and forty three. Okay. Uh, I have a personal savings that's three thousand five hundred and ninety six, and then the following three are business. So I like try to okay. pull my business expenses out of here. You know, it just but to like mm -hmm. round it all out, it's. Um, another checking that's a thousand five hundred and forty six. Uh, business savings that's eighty two dollars. Another business checking that's four thousand five hundred and twenty. And then I have my high yield savings of fourteen thousand three hundred and twenty six. Okay, perfect. So we'll keep the business separate 
for now, okay. just because okay. as business expenses come in, you have to maintain the website and stuff like that. So can I ask you a question with your, your checking account? Why do you have so much in the checking account versus putting it in high yield savings? Honestly, just because I have been too busy to look at it and I just saw that it was that much. And I last week tried transferring it over and it like, I need my debit card information and I don't have my debit card because I don't use a debit card. And so I, I just need to do like life admin stuff to mm -hmm. try to get some of that money out of there. But am open to your thoughts as to like, what is like, how much should I keep in there as like a reasonable amount? Yeah, well, I wouldn't keep as much as you are. You're getting paid. I mean, even with your business, it seems like it's very consistent, but you're getting a paycheck on a regular basis. So that will just continue to accrue. And just so I know, what's your net pay about monthly? What are you bringing home after the 401k contribution and so forth? Yeah, so after taxes, after healthcare, 401k, if we're assuming my personal business is bringing in around a thousand a month, um, that leaves me to seven thousand eight hundred and sixty-six. Perfect. A month. A month. Yeah. And that's with with the salary of one hundred and seventy-one thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So right now, how I have it split up is into my high yield savings monthly, two thousand seven hundred and forty-six. Okay. And monthly into my checking goes four thousand one hundred and twenty. Okay, it goes into your checking. Yeah. So I think I can just also, what I'd like to do is just change that distribution. Mm -hmm. You know, like I could transfer some of the current money over from my checking into my high yield, but like just from my paycheck, just to like automate as much as possible. And then ideally, since I don't have a deadline to pay back my dad and I don't have interest on that, I, I do want to like I have the funds for it, so I, mm -hmm. I start. I I had been putting it off until I could pay down my credit card debt, um, but yeah. so now that that's paid off, I want to try to like do an auto deposit of five hundred dollars a month for that into another high yield savings. My dad says that he like just to aggregate it myself first, like collect it first and then hand it over. So if I'm just like hoarding that money for now. I feel like it may as well be in a high yield. Yeah, it um, should. Yeah. So that's kind of my plan for that. Yeah, I think while, so while we have interest rates that are really nice, because we didn't, as you remember, we didn't have interest rates like this for a very long time. I think it makes sense to have your cash um, in a high yield savings account so you're making money on it. Mm -hmm. I'm making an assumption here that your checking account isn't paying you anything on the cash. Right. Yeah. Okay. You, usually they don't, but every once in a while someone's like, oh no, my checking account pays me, but usually not. Yeah. So I would just move it over. Or if it's, it's your checking account that's giving you the trouble on transferring it out, correct? Yes. Not, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing I need to tackle, but then separately I can just go into like my like work business portal payroll thing. Yeah. And yeah, so that's the, the only thing I want to go over those numbers again. So if your business is bringing in a thousand a month, it's twelve thousand a year, right? And you're making one hundred and seventy-one thousand, which is a gross number plus twelve thousand. That's one hundred and eighty-three thousand. I think your monthly take home should be a little bit higher, even with even with maxing out the four hundred one k, because you're going to max out the four hundred one k at twenty-three thousand. So I have four percent going to my Roth 401k currently, but then mm -hmm. I have an additional 16% of my income going to this employee pre-tax retirement account. Mm -hmm. And you get paid every two weeks? Yeah. Okay. And tell me again what um, your take home is every two weeks, the total between both accounts, or if you want to give me both of them again, so you can write it down. Yeah. So I have it, I can pull it up, but um Right now, I have it written down monthly. Monthly okay. going into my high yield savings is two thousand seven hundred and forty six. Okay, and then my monthly is four thousand one hundred and twenty. And that's going into so what the two thousand seven forty six goes into high yield savings, and four thousand one hundred and twenty goes into checking. Yeah, and then you're getting a thousand approximately on top of that. 
for the business. Yeah. Which would go okay. into a business account. Which would go into the business account. Okay. Okay. So that's 6866 a month. If you add yeah. up. It's significant. Like, so I haven't been on like payroll in so many years, but I will say that mm -hmm. it felt really staggering that my take home pay is if we just like divide my like my salary 171 by 12 months, I think it's around like $14,000 a month or something. Mm -hmm. So like after taxes, after all this, like I'm making less than 50%. <laughs> like, um, feels so like that's why I just want to, if you have your pay stub, what are you putting into the 401k? Because I'm just wondering if, because and when did you start your job? I started it um, mid-December. Okay. So it should... You're doing 20% total. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 20% is 34,200 if you do percentages on 171,000. So I'm wondering if what's happening is you're putting, you can't, you're not eligible to put 34,200 into your 401k unless you're doing a non deductible contribution as well, which I don't think you are because you said Roth and pre tax. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering what's happening is if you're going to max out your 401k. <laughs> earlier and then your paychecks will go up because mm. you're it's not being done evenly throughout 12 months got it that makes sense yeah um yeah because the most you can put in as pre-tax or roth like the com the combined amount of that is twenty three thousand a year which the percentage for you on your gross compensation of 171 would be 13.4 percent and you have your contribution set at 20. Yeah. So I think that's the reason the numbers aren't adding up because you're probably going to max this out earlier in the year. And then you're going to get basically like a raise when you've maxed out your 401k. I'm assuming your 401k will just stop taking the money out once you hit the $23,000 limit for employee contributions. But I think that's what's going on. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should at least be simple. That's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1 every day with no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. With AG1, I know I'm getting essential brain, gut, and immune health support with vitamins, probiotics, and nutrients from Whole Foods. I like to think of it as my nutritional insurance. I know I'm covering my nutritional basis from the very start of the day. If there's one product I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1, and that's why I've partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, plus K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. That's drinkag1.com forward slash future rich. Check it out. Yeah, I think that you'll get a bump up once you max your 401k. So you're probably doing, if I have my numbers right, around $2,850 a month into your 401k. So let's see when you're going to max this out. So you'll max out your 401k in August and then your paychecks will go up in September, October, November, and December. You won't have any 401k contributions. So your paycheck will go up. Well, some of it's pre-tax, some of it's Roth, as you pointed out, but um, the contribution will stop. So you'll get a pretty significant bump up for the last four months. Got it. Um. Or the other way to do it, which is up to you, is um, you're just going to have to readjust it twice as a percentage amount, is you could lower your percentage amount so that from this point forward, so, I mean, or at this point, you're going to be done in August. You know, basically, you have two months left of this. After two months, it'll you'll stop. But then for January, I would set it so that your contribution is going to be taken out over 12 months instead of eight months so that you, you a little easier to budget, I think. Can you say that again one more time? Sorry. 
So the, you have your contribution amount set for 20% of your salary, yeah. right? Okay, mm-hmm. so 20% of $171,000. So if you used to, we, we won't worry about the pre-tax or post-tax right now, or pre-tax or Roth right now, but 171000 okay. times 20%, right, is $34,200. The 401k employee limit is 23000 Mm, okay. So you can't put thirty four thousand two hundred dollars into your employee contribution in your four hundred one k. You're going to max out at twenty three thousand. So just for rough math, if we take thirty four thousand two hundred, which is what you've set up to contribute for the entire year because you started your job in December, right? So yeah. you set these elections up, and you were immediately eligible for the four hundred one k. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so then starting in January, we'll just take so thirty. You have it set to contribute in a year thirty four thousand two hundred. So divide that by twelve months. So you're contributing two thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars a month into your four hundred one k. So what's going to happen is when you hit twenty three thousand dollars, the four hundred one k is going to say, "Sorry, you can't put any more money in here, Raquel. You've hit the limit." Yeah. So then the next number is so if you're doing two thousand eight hundred and $50 a month, so times eight, after eight months, you're going to have put $22,800 in there. So basically, you're going to be done contributing. You're $200 shy. They'll take a partial payment on that first paycheck in in September. And then after that, you will no longer be contributing because you're going to have maxed out the IRS limit, but you're going to, most people max it out over 12 months, and you're going to do it in eight. So you're going to get your, you're going to see your paycheck go up in September, your September paychecks, October, November, and December are going to be higher because you're no longer contributing to your 401k because you did it in eight months instead of over 12. Got it. That makes sense. So what you can do is you're so close to having it done. You might as well just, in my, if it were me, I would just leave it alone for the time being. And then in September, your paychecks are going to go up because you're going to have already contributed to your 401k and maxed it out. Is in January, so I would set an alert in your phone right now. That says Mm -hmm. in December, if you want to do everything in advance, so even November, because you're already done for the year. But starting in January, your new contribution limit, whatever the contribution is going to be for 2025, I would do the percentage so that you're doing it over 12 months and you're not doing it over eight months. So for instance, let's just say next year, the limit is 24,000. I don't know if they've announced the 2025. Let's see, 2025 401k. Do we have that number yet? Well, let's just use the same number. So it's, let's just say next year, it's also going to be 23,000. So for 171,000, you would contribute a total if you wanted to have it come out evenly across the year, it it should be 13.4%, not 20. And then that would allow you to contribute more evenly, meaning contribute a partial amount one month over the course of the year versus doing all of your contributions in 12 in eight months instead of 12. Right. So then your paychecks will be more comfortable. <laughs> that makes sense. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. So then let's say we get to like September 15th, right? I'm fully maxed out on this. Like mm-hmm. essentially last year I was kind of like living off of no income and then got back to work, have this great income. And after a year of not having income, my lifestyle creep um significantly diminished like Mm i you reset you know yes and what i don't want to happen is to have that lifestyle creep again so i'm trying to like live off of as little as possible Mm -hmm. and put as much away so if it can't go into my 401k like where should it be going Well, two things. One, you can find out if your 401k allows for a non-deductible contribution and then a in-plan conversion. And then what you could do is you could continue with this high contribution amount. You'll have to adjust your Roth and your pre-tax options because Uh those are the IRS limit. But you can put more money in your 401k if you do it as a non-deductible dollar if your plan allows it. And then your plan may allow for what's called an in-plan conversion. And then you can you can convert the non-deductible contributions into raw. 
It's a little bit complicated. So I would just start with investigating whether or not your plan allows for non-deductible contributions. And if so, then ask the follow-up question of, do you allow for uh, in-plan Roth conversions? And then go from there. The other option is you can contribute it to your non-retirement investments and continue mm-hmm. to build your non-retirement investments. I don't think you need to have any more in cash. I think you have plenty saved in cash given that your all of your monthly expenses are just over 5,000. So if let's just say we left 5,000 in your personal checking, we moved another 13,000 and change over to your high yield savings. That get, gets you to 27,000 and change in high yield savings. I think that's a comfortable spot for you to be if we consider what your just your fixed expenses are, even a little bit more. Um, so I would leave that alone, but I would get that other money into the high yield savings. And then with the excess that you're going to get once you're maxed out with the 401k, it would be either, and this is a personal preference. It's either, do you want to see if there's availability to get more money in the Roth, which you can do via this in-plan conversion if your 401k has the features that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And if not, and you want to keep it a little simpler, you could just take the excess money and invest it into the market because I think you have enough in cash for the time being. Now, I think the the one thing is I agree with you that I wouldn't let the lifestyle creep back in, especially given the fact that you would like to retire at 45, which I think the hard part about, so you're going to really have to ramp up saving over the next 10 years. Yeah. So to, to give you an idea, and this is just a textbook benchmark, but if you... I don't know if you've heard this, but to get an estimate of how much could your uh, investments pay you, for instance, for an early retirement, and what I like to do is if you want to retire at 45, I'd like to, and this is why I asked you to separate this, is I would like to separate your retirement monies from your non-retirement monies. And the reason why is, as we talked about, your retirement monies have the provision that if you take money before 59 and a half, there's a 10% penalty. Now, there are ways around that 10% penalty. But for purposes of this discussion, let's just say we're going to leave that alone because what I don't like to do is I don't like to ever jeopardize what I like to call permanent retirement or old age retirement. If your money runs out at 75, you don't want to go back to work, right? So I don't like to jeopardize old age retirement because anybody who's ever said, yeah, I'll be working at 75, I'm sure I still want to work. Nobody really wants to work at 75. And if they do, it's because they're capable of retirement. So if they're not having to work, they're choosing to work. And having and choosing are very different. And so I think it's really important to protect what I call the old age retirement. And so if we're going to do an early retirement, I like to separate it and then have enough for your early retirement, which is generally just in the ages here, would be those individually owned non-retirement assets. So the textbook rule here is 4%, right? So if you get your non-retirement up, so let's just start saying you start saving... 2000. Well, how much are you putting? Let's see. We have high yield. I'm just seeing your breakdown and your checking. So you, you have 2746 going to high yields, your high yield savings account, and you have 4120 going into your checking. Although mm-hmm. in your checking, let me just go back to my notes here. You, we had down that your total expenses for the month were 5400 right? So if we're putting... Yeah. 4,120 in there. We don't quite have enough for the month, but I know that that's because like you put travel in there as you're budgeting monthly for it, even though it's like maybe once or twice a year, right? So even if we took that out, that still gives you 49. So we're still a little shy on the checking, but let's just say the high yield savings, since you have enough in there now, we have, let's just say we'll take, I don't know, 1,800. So we match up with the budget a little better. Um, 1800 from there, that's monthly. And then let's say we have that four months where you're going to have the higher paycheck. So let's just say you're going to get another 1800 over four months from there. And that one's 12. So let's just say we could probably do oops, 12. You could probably add 20, 21,600. And if you were really, really strict about it, you could probably do closer to 20. 8,000. And that is me taking from your high yield savings, instead of allowing that to go into high yield savings, taking, I think you really need to put some more back in checking so that the monthly number we have is actually hitting checking. And then you yeah. can allocate the 500 a month and pre-save for vacations and so forth. So if we say we really need 5,400 a month, minus what you're putting in checking, you're sh- short like 1,300. So if we take the 2,746, 
that goes into high yield t- savings minus thirteen hundred. That gives you fourteen hundred, right? A month. Mm-hmm. That doesn't go into high yield savings, but goes into the market instead. And so over twelve months, you're adding seventeen thousand into your it was Betterment account, right? Yeah. And then if you get two thousand a month back over four months, give or take, it depends on where you're going to fall because the 401k turns off. So that's times four. That's another 8,000, right? That could go into the Betterment account plus your 17,000. That's 25,000 a year that goes into that account. And you could do, I mean, 10 years feels like a long time. I know because you just started this job and you don't love corporate, but if you stuck with that, that's $25,000 a year going into your investment account. And that is 23,000 a year going into your 401k, right? So you're saving, you know, 48,000 a year, give or take. I'm sure there'll be months where things come up and it's not possible to do that. But if you save 25,000, you know, over 10 years in the investment account, that's 250,000 plus earnings because it'll be invested plus what you've started with. So we could kind of strap, let's see what that would look like on an investment calculator. Okay. So we're going to start 30,007. Seven, six, four, and we're going to say that we're going to contribute monthly. Why don't we just use the 1400 number? See what that looks like. And we'll say we have a rate of return of 7.2%, which is the compounding, the magic compounding interest. And you have 10 years. So that says that if you're doing 1400 monthly with compounding return of 7.2% and you have 10 years to grow with the starting balance you currently have and you add 1400 a month to that, that'll be worth approximately 300,000. Ugh. Is it? Yeah. Well, 300,000 is a lot of money. It's just not a lot of money to retire on. Yeah. Ugh, it's so... But, so that would, yeah, that would generate 12,000 a year. Which... Yeah. It's tough. I feel really jaded I think like living in New York for so long. So before this current apartment, I know this apartment's super cheap. Previously, my rent was almost $3,000 a month. Um, Like living in New York is just so expensive. Expensive, yep. I think one of the most like shocking and depressing things that I've come to realize as my income has grown is like if you would have told me 10 years ago that I was making $200,000 a year, I would be like, that's baby, that's yacht money. I'm going to have a house here, a house (laughs) over there. Like, and it, it just, it's so far from that. It's like that affords me to live comfortably, not in the lap of luxury, but just comfortably. And so to hear $300,000 a year, I'm like, that's a year and a half of work. That's what it, it gets Mm -hmm. me. Like, it, that is not telling you what your 401k will end up being, right? But the thing is, I don't want you to use your 401k to retire at 45. The reason why is life expectancy for a female is like into your 80s. So you, you need the money to last for 40 years, right? 45 years. It's a long time. If you think about how long you contributed to the 401k, so let's just say this 401k. So we're starting with 14,300, right? And you're going to be contributing. I'm just going to do a monthly number just to even this out. So we're just going to say you're doing 1900 a month, right? On that account. Mm-hmm. So that actually is, ends up being worth more. That ends up being worth with 7.2% compounding interest. This is just an estimate, 360,000, right? Because it's a higher contribution amount than what we're doing in the... So at that time, just using these two accounts, right, with these starting values, with these contributions over the next 10 years, you would have over, you know, close to $700,000 saved, not looking at the Roth, not looking at anything else. So that is a lot of money that you could accumulate in that time frame. That's also not looking at your business income. So you, you can really make a huge move in your net worth by using this really high income and what I will say are low expenses relative to the area. Right. So the benefit of being in the New York City area is the salaries are a lot higher. You aren't going to go upstate and get paid one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Right. So you're in an area where 
there are all these industries that are highly paid and industries that aren't available in other parts of the world, right? Like, Totally. So, but it's going to take time and a very high savings ratio for you to really see the effect of that. Does that make sense? Saving $23,000 a year is great over 30 years or 40 years. But if you want to really see a big impact in 10 years, it has to be a very high savings ratio, which you're perfectly capable of doing. And what I would say is I don't want the numbers to discourage you from doing it. I think you should still do this. And while $300,000 might not allow you to fully retire, it could allow you to say, I no longer have to save at this level anymore, right? Because I have enough money saved. So now if I do my own business at 45, all I need to worry about is supplementing my income. And I don't also additionally need to save for retirement. That's another way you could look at this. Got it. Yeah. Cause that was my question. So like, it's like what, I like how you're separating like old age retirement versus like fun money retirement, Uh, (laughs) but like young retirement, (laughs) early retirement. Yeah. yeah. Um, So in this equation of like, I want to retire by 45, I get access to my old age retirement at essentially 60. That's 15 years of living expenses that I will need to cover. And I guess my question is for this as well, like if I am even be able to execute living expenses for those 15 years, Mm -hmm. how do I think about, and would I need to think about adding to retirement to that during that time as well? No, I don't think so. Cause I think it would, so it'll depend on twofold. One, I am a big believer of social security. It's, I think it's one of our, the, you know, best entitlement systems that we've created as a country, I think it has a marketing problem, frankly. And so I would pull your social security statement. You can do that now. It's ssa.gov and see what the projected amount is that you're going to get. You're not going to collect at 60, but our age probably will be currently 67 is full retirement. It's probably going to be 70, but just see what that number is, right? Because that's a fixed amount that will come in monthly. And that's a good number to know. So if you retire at 60, you know what I like to envision is like another train car pulls in at 70 with money, right? Because no one turns down money and you've contributed to it. So even though people say it's not going to matter, like, well, if you're getting $2,000 a month, that's actually pretty nice if you think about it. Yeah, Um, that's That's a nice way to start your month. I mean, when people give it a bad rap, it's like, well, if you don't want it, you don't give it away, right? Like you don't want $2,000 a month. You could give it to somebody who would be happy for it. So I think this is pretty has to be fixed and will be fixed because it's our largest entitlement system. Um, it hasn't been really made over in around a hundred years. So anything else that's a hundred years old has probably had a facelift or a remodel. Yeah. So the system just hasn't had enough attention. Obviously after a hundred years, if it was a house, it would be falling down if no one did anything to it. Right. So I will look at your SSA.gov statement and see what that's going to be at 70. Cause that's a key factor in mm-hmm. my opinion. It is for most people today, the largest source of, income that they have in retirement and that's not where you want to be in retirement so that's good to know that you want it to be a supplement to your retirement and not the largest source of income right so whatever that number is that should in my opinion represent around a third of what your income should be in retirement to be comfortable so that two-thirds of your income you've supplied and social security supplies around one-third so i think what would be and these are all estimates because it's whether or not you retire in New York city and decide to stay there. Right. But if you didn't touch all your investments, like if you actively, what I would call front load your old age retirement between now and 45, and then at 45, you said, I have enough saved. Cause based on our estimates, you'll have 700. So let's just say with everything else, let me just see here. Okay. So we're not adding to any of the other ones. So we had a total of 53,000 in retirement, but I'm going to subtract out the 401k because you're adding to that. So that's already been accounted for. So that's 30. So let's say we have another 39 and over 10 years that goes to concert would go to 80. So let's say you have around 780 at 45. (laughs) That's a great number. So let's start with the positive, right? Like that if you're able to save, which is a very aggressive saving ratio over the next 10 years, you're going to end up with 
depending on the market, if we were averaging 7.2, let's just say somewhere between seven and eight hundred thousand dollars saved. That's fantastic, right? So then at that point, if you don't touch any of that money and you're 45, and we'll just use the higher number. And at 45 years old, you got yourself to a net worth of eight hundred thousand dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Then at 55, right, that goes to 1.6 million, right? And let's just be conservative and use 65 as your old age retirement because 1.6 should then go to 3.2 million, right? That's without adding. That's just with compounding of interest to 7.2%. And so if you have 3.2 million at 65, right, and you're pulling 4% off of that, you're able to pull $128,000 a year off of that portfolio and you still have social security. Yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> so, that's, so that sounds better. So if I said to you, for the next 10 years, you should be saving around $50,000 a year. So 23000 in your 401k, you'll max it out. And then the rest of it goes into your investment account, right? Which we worked out to be the 1400 a month and then plus this next 8000 or over the next four months, right? Because And then we'll fix it so it evens out to be a monthly number. You're not front-loading the 401k next year. And if you can commit to that, and there'll be months where it doesn't happen, right? Something right. comes up and you need extra cash or you decide to take a more expensive vacation, then you budget it 6000 a year for vacation. And vacation goes to 8000 one year or whatever. Yeah. But if you can commit to that and do that on a regular interval over the next 10 years, I think what the opportunity is it's not that you can retire, but that you can have your own business again and not have the obligation to be saving for retirement because you've set yourself up that you have a lot in retirement and then you also have a lot in non-retirement. So if your business needed something, you could lend against that, right? You could lend against that to get money for a down payment so you don't have to deplete those investments if you don't want to. Then you give yourself what I like to call optionality. Optionality to me is the most important thing. I think it's more important than really anything else, but You're going to save for 10 years to buy yourself options at 45. What they are, we don't know, but I would think that you would have the option to have your own business again, not have the need to have it make $200,000, but have it make a hundred. So maybe you're working half the time and all you need to do are cover your costs, but you don't need to save 50,000 a year for retirement anymore. Yeah. Can I ask you one question just Mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm following? So going back to like redistributing right now, how I'm allocating my income. So I should consider putting 1400 a month towards these exchange investments. Into your investment account. Yeah. Because you're putting it into high yield savings and 5% fixed over 10 years is not going to dramatically okay. increase your net worth as much as, I don't know what your returns have been on those investments. So I just used an average of 7.2%, but you can probably go in and see yeah. what the returns have been historically on those investments. And then let's say September 15th, I max out my retirement contributions. Mm -hmm. Then I should up this by $400. Is that correct? Or $800? So I would actually do even more into your investment accounts because if I'm correct, you should get another, some of it's pre-tax and post-tax, but you should get, let's just say another 2000 back in your paycheck for September, October, November, and December, give or take. So I would put that in the investment account as well. And then starting next year, what I would do is I would do your 401k contribution over 12 months and not eight. And then I would also, I I would change your check, the amount going into your checking to match what your budget is. Right. And then the balance of that, nothing needs to go into high yield savings, whatever the difference is there, that goes into investments. Okay. So 1400 goes into non-retirement investments until mid-September. Mm-hmm. And then once that hits, it should really be 3400 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then next year, it should be... It'll just be level. It'll be evened out. Yeah, you have... Because monthly, you have 6866 coming in, right? But that should go up because you're not going to have the 401k maxed out. So let's just say you're bringing in... I'm just going to do 2000 you You'll have 8866 coming in. And then we'll subtract out what you need for your budget, which is pre-allocating for vacation, which I like. So just minus the 5,400. So you sh- you have there 3,400 left over. Yeah. I would give yourself a little more wiggle room than I would take if that all pans out, right? Because the tax room vacation, the pre-tax, you're going to not see as much of that back as you would in the 401k because it's a pre-tax expense and that's the majority of your contribution. But I would take 
at least 2000 of that. And I would put 2000 of that 3,400 that we in theory have left over. And I would put that in the investment account. Got it. And right now what I have in high yield savings is like enough. So like just my check really should be going to my personal checking to cover my monthly expenses. Yep. And yeah, your monthly expenses and And then then the rest, and you can give yourself more of a buffer. Yeah. And then the rest I would be investing. If you add 13,000 from your personal checking into your high yield savings account, you have $27,000 in your high yield savings account. Yeah. That's like five months of money, like everything with vacation allocation. So I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I do agree with you because you went through a period and you just paid off all this credit card debt. So you've readjusted the lifestyle creep, right? Which is not a fun process to readjust down. No. Yeah. I'm with you. It is. There's so much ego death and it is just so humbling and not fun. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm here now and I feel like I have a lot of perspective and like trying to take that after like an incredibly difficult, emotional, financial, mental, everything year, the, the glimmer of hope from that is that like, okay, this was a very, productive financial reset and just like, you know, how to be happy with less, not feel like I'm cutting and I'm lacking and I'm sad and that I'm missing things, but like genuinely getting to a place where I'm happy and content having a smaller life, you know? Yeah. And is there anything that you gave up that like you missed tremendously and feel like your life isn't complete without? Um, No, I think I did for a while. And I think it's honestly, it just, in so many ways, it felt like grieving, grieving the sort of lifestyle or status or, you know, how I indulged and what I indulged in. And like, I feel like I'm past that now. I've like, I've mourned, I've grieved that. And now I'm just like, I don't feel like I'm missing or lacking anything. Yeah, I think that this is a unique opportunity now that you're back making basically the, about the income you were with the business to get Mm -hmm. back in there. So I would use an opportunity to be like, I'm happy with where I am and I don't need all of these things that society says I need or to live this lifestyle society implies I should have because of my income. And I'm going to use it to have something tangible at the end of it. Right. So after 10 years, my goal is that I have, a big net worth that will allow me to do something that most people can't, which is to get off the corporate hamster wheel. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's pretty much it is that like, I feel like I've gone to a point where I'm like, no, the biggest flex isn't like a cool flashy car or a cool membership here, there, whatever cool clothes. It's like the biggest flex is if I can retire early, like that is to me, there Mm -hmm. is no bigger flex. Like that is what I want. So Yeah, to have financial security and options because you did something that most people aren't willing to do, which is to increase their savings ratio, keep their expenses low, and move the needle for themselves. Because a decade actually, as you know, will go very quickly. And in the scheme of your entire life, to spend 10 years changing your financial trajectory isn't really that long. It takes most people 30 years, right, to save and accrue. (laughs) So if you're able to do a meaningful, like this would be a meaningful change, right? We would go from having a total of what, a hundred thousand to somewhere near eight in 10 years. That's a very meaningful difference. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your insight and your help and your thoughts. This has been really illuminating. I mean, I, I said this earlier, but I think there's such a degree of like, yes, gratitude with the income that I have, but also overwhelm of being like, I don't know what to do with this. And so often what would end up happening is that I'd use it in really like non-productive ways, like going shopping or doing, you know, like, and having my expenses not really align with what my overall ultimate goal is. Yeah. Well, I, I absolutely think this is an opportunity. I think that your expenses relative to your income are very reasonable. And so what I would do is max out the 401k, but over 12 months. And then I would just set the payroll to go and match your expenses, which is like 5,400. You could bump it up and do 6,000. And then the balance of that all gets invested. Mm -hmm. And then don't look at it for a decade. (laughs) (laughs) 
and then we'll have to have you back on. Maybe we'll be back on sooner to see what the progress is. But oh my god, yeah, accountability, please. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. I loved this conversation. Yes. Thank you so much for coming on. And for all of our lovely listeners, if you like the show, please share it with a friend and subscribe and follow below because we really would appreciate it. And you can follow our Instagram at Future Rich Podcast for our most up-to-date information. Time for our disclaimer. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance references are historical and do not guarantee future results. Make sure that you consult with your own legal, tax, and or financial advisor before making any decisions.